If instrumental music is so important, why have others not seen it? Uh, our speaker is Steve Wolfgang. When I first uh, remember Steve Wolfgang, he was a, a very young preacher, and I was a very young sinner, maybe not even accountable yet. Um, so I may not have even reached the age of accountability. But he, uh, he married the daughter of the local preacher where I attended, Billy Ashworth. And so uh, he came for a meeting. And I can remember some of those lessons from uh, so many years ago. And I, over the years, Steve has studied much and diligently and reached out to many. Uh, as he spoke last year at Harding on this very subject, as they asked him to, to present those lessons there. Uh, he, has, he has studied the Bible thoroughly. He has studied history well, and he would be, he's very qualified to speak to us on this subject. Steve. Outset that Harding gave me three hours to do this. <laughs> and if, if you have the book, and I'm going to be referring to the book on and off, and you'd like to look at that, I've packed as much as I could into 20 pages and 50 foot. It's a lot of information in the notes, buried safely there where it cannot harm anyone. And you are welcome to it. I am delighted to be here. Uh, with Betty, who I met on this campus 50 years ago. This is my 50th class reunion. She's much younger than I am. And I'm delighted she's here. Some of you know we had a, a scare a few months ago, but it's good to be here. And if you're looking at the book, you'll notice that I pay attention to at least one of my mentors here, Brother Melvin Curry, though I could mention others. Um, Brother Curry was responsible in many ways for my intellectual and other kinds of development here. And I suggested that you go get the lecture book from 2005 and that in that regard, a lot of what I say in the first part of this lecture is redundant because of the masterful job that he did that year. But I'm also conscious of the fact that today's freshman class was just entering elementary school in 2005. It might as well not have existed as far as they are concerned. And it goes back to some of the remarks that Jeff Wilson was talking about yesterday, particularly of the need to uh, teach our young people not only the right doctrinal ideas, but the function of the process of how we get there. And I say a hearty amen to all that. Even before I came to Florida College, when Farrell Jenkins came, before he taught here, came to Indianapolis as the local preacher when I was a junior in high school, another huge influence on me, one of the first things that I did was to run the, pro, the overhead projector for all of this, this is a PowerPoint in antiquity. Farrell had all of these projection slides. You remember the old ones back in the cardboard frames? And uh, that sort of got me hooked as well. But it was a debate with a Christian church preacher on the subject of instrumental music. And it was the first real systematic exposure that I had as a teenager just coming to spiritual maturity in some ways, recently baptized. And so I'm appreciative of that. And uh, the book is dedicated to uh, Ed Harrell this year. My brother Homer Haley is another uh, one of those ghosts that I see in my mind's eye still walking across this campus. One of the things that they taught me, maybe the main thing that they taught me, intellectually and spiritually anyway, is to try to do my best to be an independent thinker. And we've heard about that already this week. But I often hear that framed in terms of we ought to be independent thinkers. Let that sit with you for a moment. We ought to be as though there were some uh, elite independent thinking society. 
that we can attain to membership in. It's something that you do individually, something that anybody who's a Christ, any Christian who's been through graduate school and kept his faith certainly has had to do. And sometimes it involves taking issue even with one's mentor mentors, and that can be a really messy business. But we're here today to try to think about this question of instrumental music. Um, I've got a daunting assignment, and I hope this PowerPoint is going to work. I think the spacing on it uh, may be bad, but you can still read it. Um, what's supposed to happen is that I'm asked to deal with a number of different subjects that range everywhere from biblical text to entertainment to uh, what has become of all of the, uh, the old arguments about uh, the piano and the organ and solo and all of that sort of thing. Do instruments change the, the nature as the nature of instrumental music changes? And why do we get this, this wall of silence? once we move from the Old Testament to the New. I'll note for Jared Saltz's uh, benefit that even though this is a church history lecture, probably 40% of my lectures actually rooted in the Old Testament because you, you, we, you cannot understand really the impact of this wall of silence, uh, the exact opposite if some of you remember Phil Spector's wall of sound concept. You get to the New Testament and it's almost like hitting a wall of silence about instruments of music which were widely known in antiquity. And so I want to address some of those kinds of things. And uh, there's, a, there's a caveat to the short answer to this. Let me get just to the, uh, the minority position I did. This is in the back of the book if you want to look at it, page 220 and 21 if you're there. If you have your Bible, you want to turn to Amos 5 because we're going to get there momentarily. Uh, the short answer to this is that most, why haven't most people seen it? Well, if you look at church history, the simple fact is, the deceptively simple uh, answer is, most people have seen it. Or at least, and the caveat is, just because someone practices something doesn't mean they necessarily believe it or could give you a good answer for why they do that, but for the first entire millennium of church history, not just in the New Testament, but there's this complete absence of any reference to instruments of music and in fact all kinds of references to the fact that this is not just an argument from silence, but New Testament Christians did not use instrumental music. If you read the, the, the church fathers that Brother Dilbeck told us a little bit about yesterday. And in fact, it does not become popular until well into the second millennium and only particularly in this country really widespread with regard to instruments of music until the last couple of hundred years. So I have a quotation uh, in, the, in the book that deals with that. Um, that This is not mine. This is not Church of Christ theology here. And I'm going to have to move over here to read uh, as several historians of music have noted, our current situation in which there is widespread and often unquestioning acceptance of instruments in worship is a minority position in the church's whole history. That is absolutely correct. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of several guys, Paul Westermeyer, Calvin Stapert, Robert Weber. These are well-known historians of music, even outside, including, but outside the widely known evangelical circles of music. It's, it's just an incontrovertible fact that this idea that we have today, that it's an odd position, an odd idea not to use instruments, is a recent idea. And for much of church history, the, the tradition at least was that you simply do not use instruments of music in the public worship of the church. And so Brother Everett Ferguson, in this case, the very term used in musical circles as many of you know, but I did this recently in a lecture and uh, several people said, I didn't know this. So let's get this out of the way. The very term for unaccompanied music sums up the evidence of church history. A cappella simply means the way it was done in the church from Latin by way of the Italian. How did they do it in the church? They did it without instrumental music. And so the classical form of church music is unaccompanied song. To abstain from instrumental music is not the peculiar aberration of a frontier American sect because this was easily, the uh, until recent, comparatively recent times, the majority position in terms of church history. And I would 
highly recommend that you, if you don't already have it, get a copy of Everett Ferguson's book. It's in print in the fourth edition. Uh, it's on Logos if you use that particular program. So we're going to look at, first of all, you've seen the sort of thing, all the different arguments that are used to defend instrumental music. Most of them are in the book or some kind of reference or answer to it. But I want to start with something that's not in the book, uh, a kind of a case study, if you will. Um, there's a Facebook group called I'm Fed Up With Bad Church Music. I am a member of that group. <laughs> I, I helped to edit a hymnal for that very reason in, in some ways, among other reasons. But it has thousands of members. Uh, Brother Scott Wyatt, a former director of the chorus down here and now the director of the Voices of Symphonia and uh, Concordia Sacri. Some of you know uh, those groups that have done a number of CDs. Uh, Scott posted a question that was only tangentially regarding instrumental music, but it turned into a kind of a, a forum on the instrument. The pr I printed it out, put it in small type. It's still 30 pages. And here's what most of them said about it. And these are people who are professional church musicians, most of, if not all of them, instrumental uh, advocates. Um, it's weird, was the main response. I'm unfamiliar with this. This is an odd position. I didn't know there were anybody, any people around who still did that sort of thing, which is really, if you stop to think, but these are professional church musicians, and they don't know that this is only a recent development, that the, for the vast majority of church history, this, the weird position was to use the instrument as far as that's concerned. But the second leading category of answers was what I call David did it. Uh, that is, the Old Testament tells us to do that, and if David did it, it must be okay. We're going to unpack that in just a few moments. Uh, some other things, well, it's not really all that important. And one of the takeaways from this lesson, I, th I hope, is going to be who gets to decide that? Who, who gets to say, with regard to something God Almighty has said, who gets to decide this is important and that isn't? And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I, I simply put in the manuscript toward the end, what, what do we know? Kind of six or seven major uh, groups of ideas. There's an idea that uh, the reason instrumental music is not used is uh, because it wasn't widely known. Well, if you go to the Oriental Institute or the University of Pennsylvania or anywhere, we've got a, at, at the OI at the University of Chicago, we've got an entire case plus of these old instruments of music. They were widely known and used all throughout antiquity up to and including Second Temple Judaism, the New Testament era and beyond. They were used in warfare, in entertainment. They were used in pagan temples. They were used in the Jewish temple, this idea that it was unknown and therefore that's the reason it wasn't used uh, is simply a position of ignorance as far as that's concerned. There's detailed information about what we know in the Old Testament and I've listed about a half a dozen passages there. I want to start with the last one first and that's Amos 5 that I was suggested turning to a moment ago, often used as a proof text, take away from me the noise of your songs. The text says, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. And somebody says, ah, there it is. God doesn't like instrumental music. Um, some of us would find that mildly humorous, I think, today. But the truth is that was a pretty well-known position. I think because, I mean, I've heard gospel preachers say this. I think because many of them have had read Adam Clark's commentary. Clark's the, the first main source I've been able to document this from, and a lot of preachers read that. And while I agree with his ultimate position, the process by which he got there is wrong. And it, 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 we don't need to use a bad argument in favor even of a biblical position. That's one of the takeaways from this lesson. If you look at Amos 6 and, and 1 and then 5, you get the same kind of rhetoric. In it. We're at ease in, or Israel's at ease in Zion, and they chant to the sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. Well, there's a little bit of archaeological evidence that David may have designed and built instruments. That's maybe what this refers to. Uh, in the Megiddo Gallery at the Oriental Institute, there are symbols from the time of David. Whether he actually used them, of course, is not, uh, not a provable kind of proposition. But, but think about this for a moment. 
Go back to Amos chapter 5 and notice the rest of the text. I hate and despise your feast days and I will not smell in your... I don't want your sacrifices, God says. Why? Because he said, I I never gave any legislation about that, never told them to do that. No, because God will not accept worship which is offered with unclean hands and an impure heart. Fundamental biblical principle. Even if we're doing the right thing and we're doing it in a way that Israel was doing it at ease in Zion without paying attention to the manner in which God says this is to be done. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and meal offering, meat offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. And yet God gave line upon line and precept upon precept, telling them to do exactly that. They did it because he authorized it, he commanded it, but in this case they were doing it in a wrong manner. And if you look at that, it's also, by the way, rules out songs, vocal music, does it not I won't accept your songs I've had brethren when I've done this in meetings various places say well but um, I don't read anything before the time of David about instruments of music well come over to Numbers chapter 10 where again we get this explicit instruction about uh, making these two trumpets of silver and how they're to be done and uh, with the kind of material that's to be used and so forth Uh, recently somebody said to me yeah but that was just used for the, the calling of the camp together or an alarm for war and so forth well read verse 10 in the day of your gladness and your appointed feasts On the first days of your months, the feast of the new moon, in other words, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a reminder. I think the ESV says memorial here. Before your God, for I am the Lord your God. I don't know what that sounds like to you, but it sounds to me like what God is saying is when you worship, when you come to these appointed feasts that I have authorized, I want you to use these instruments of music as a portion of your worship. And you can find that. And there's a whole section in here about the Psalms. But Psalm 81, for example, sing aloud to the God, raise a song, strike the timbrel, the harp, the lute, blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon. Just exactly as he had said in the text that we just read. For this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. And other Psalms that I cite in the text indicate maybe even back to when he brought them up out of the land of Egypt. It was a part of God's intention. So the idea that instrumental music was never like God just was always prejudiced against instrumental music, but he had this little soft spot for David described in both Testaments as a man after God's own heart, so he kind of let him get away with that, is just simply a false argument and wrong. And if you look, for example, at the temple instruments, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and then come over to chapter 5 and 2 Chronicles, David gave Solomon the plan, the plan for the temple, admonishing him to be careful to do all that God has with a whole heart and a willing mind. And then look at this text in verse 19. All the Lord, all this the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the details of this pattern for the temple that David designed but never was able to build and if you come over to Second Chronicles chapter 5 and you read about all of the priests and the instruments and the, uh, the, the worship that was to be done specifically said to be with instruments of music with, without question God ordained this in Old Testament worship they were singing Levites with cymbals and harps and lyres and trumpeters to sing in the house of Lord, the Lord with all of these instruments it, it's too plain to be denied and then when you come over to the, to the Old Testament restoration if you will the temple has fallen into some state of disrepair and uh, Hezekiah comes to the throne commissions people they go out they find a copy of the law they read it and there is at least from the royal household a sense of reform restoration if you will and so we're told that Hezekiah set Levites in the house of the Lord with symbols and psalteries and all of these other instruments that are described there according to the commandment of David I've heard preachers read this text and stop right there like that was a period instead of a comma yes it's true David used them but not only David Gad the king seer a prophet Nathan a prophet nobody's yes man looked David in the eye and says thou art the man 
For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets, and the Levites stood with the instruments of David, and the priest with the trumpets about which we've already read, and Hezekiah commanded the offer to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. When it began, the song of the Lord began, vocal music, if you will, and the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel, the singers sang, the trumpeters sounded. All of this continued until the burnt offering was ended. I ask the question, what makes it right? What makes any religious practice right? What makes it right is God said it. In the Old Testament, he commanded it time and time and time again, over a period of time, over generations, all the way back to when they came out of captivity, all the way up to the destruction of the temple. That's what they were to do. In the New Testament, it would be right. Wouldn't be a thing wrong with using instruments of music in the New Testament. If I had my way about it, we'd do that. I like instrumental music. If God left it up to me, or asked me, or I sometimes say, if, if I were going to build my church. Some of you think that's funny. I do too, actually. But, <laughs> you know, if Luther or Calvin or some of these other people could do it, why can't I? And in my church, we'd have instrumental music. Why? Because I like it. And we would not mess around with a piano or even, and we'd have the big 72-pipe organ, actually, but we'd have us a 110-piece symphonic band and a choir that would make the Warren Tabernacle Choir look like a junior high school chorus. Why? Because I like that. <laughs> Problem is, God didn't ask me what I wanted. It's not my church. And so if God commanded it, that would make it right in the New Testament. But instead, what we get is, in fact, this, this wall of silence. Now... Let me do one other thing before we get out of the Old Testament. And if David McClister is here, I want to know that I started five minutes late, all right? <laughs> I need all my allotted time. Look over in Leviticus chapter 8. Let's start there. Because I want to come to a famous text in verse chapter 10 that is sometimes uh, ridiculed. You read through Leviticus 8, I won't take the time to read it, but a dozen times maybe you get this mantra, they did all the things that God commanded, just as God commanded, exactly as God commanded Moses, over and over and over and over again, just as God commanded, just as God commanded, just as God commanded, just as God commanded, and you hit chapter 10, and God had not commanded. The contrast is stark. And what was not commanded was the, the strange fire of Nadab and Abihu, or Nadab and Abihu, as we say in Bible class, however you want to pronounce that. It's an interesting use of this. Some people ridicule it as um, precision obedience, or Church of Christ theology, or COC hermeneutic. Well, there's a, there's a text from a, stand, a quotation from a standard hermeneutics textbook published by a major evangelical publisher, I think I've got the citation in here later, that talks about God had carefully shown the way by the, which the Israelites might atone for their sins and maintain a right relationship with himself. That's what this text is about. Not just the offering of something not authorized. Don't lose sight of the bigger picture. The distinction between holy and unholy, between common or clean and unclean, have been clearly demonstrated by God and were told to the sons of Aaron to teach this. And yet they violated this very principle. Now, listen to this for a moment. They'd have an Abihu in an act of self-will, had substituted their own form of worship, obscuring the distinction between God, the holy, God's commands, and the common, that is man's self-initiated religious actions. These actions, had they not been quickly rebuked, might easily have led to the assimilation of personal pagan practices in the worship of God. This is Verkler and Agayo, standard text on hermeneutics. And they go on to make a second, maybe even larger point about this that has to do with the grace of God that my good friend and classmate Harold Hancock just talked to us a little bit about. Sometimes we miss the deep background of grace in passages even where, where it is not mentioned specifically. A second lesson found in, in, here is the fact that reconciliation with God depends upon the grace of God, not on man's self-willed and self-initiated practices. The means of reconciliation and atonement had been given by God Nadab and Abihu attempted to add something to God's means of reconciliation. As such, they stand as an example, an unapproved example, I guess we would say, 
of all people or fall all people in all religions that substitute their own actions for God's grace as a means of reconciliation and salvation. That is not Church of Christ theology. I mean, we teach that, and rightly so, and we need to make the larger point behind this, or points behind it, that it's not just even about the technicality of doing what God said, although that's their God commanded, and they did it exactly as Moses said, until they didn't, and then they learned existentially what that meant. Just like Moses had learned from his disobedience, like David had. I won't unpack that, but it, it's in the book. So, do we find, or can we use this Old Testament authority that we've seen in the New Testament? What, what Old Covenant practices can we find in the Old Testament that would be suitable to use that authority to bring them over? Can we burn incense in worship? Should we offer animal sacrifices? Should we have a fixed location in a tabernacle or a temple? All of these were, were part of the Old Covenant. Levitical priests, instrumental music. People want to go to the Old Testament and say, David did it, or like stick in your thumb and pull out a plum and say, what a good boy am I, but they want to talk about the rest of these sorts of things priestly vestments all of these were part that given in detail in the law read the last third of the book of exodus about the tabernacle and all the priestly vestments if you want to do that the point is jesus christ cannot be your high priest you want to go back to the old testament for authority and what to worship the fulcrum the fundamental point here is if you want to do that if that's where you derive your authority then you are operating under a system in which jesus christ the Lion of Judah cannot function as your high priest, certainly not under any kind of a Levitical system. Well, what else do we know about this? There's the fact that musical instruments were used in religious worship through Second Temple Judaism in the New Testament era. We know that they were known and featured in pagan worship. Already talked a little bit about that. I'll not reiterate all of that. We also know that music in worship is discussed specifically in numerous New Testament passages. In addition to all the others that talk about piping and dancing and weddings and funerals and the, the lifeless instruments and the trumpet that gives an uncertain sound, these people were not unfamiliar with instruments. They were a part of their everyday life. And yet in the worship of Almighty God, the testimony is, the uniform testimony is they simply did not do that. So if we wanted to look at the New Testament, I mean, you would think... Since instrumental music is just so commonly accepted, and everybody does it today, I mean, you would think you would find authority for it all over the New Testament, just to pick a page and turn to that page, and you'd find it there. So do we find it frequently discussed in the New Testament? Did Jesus' apostles and disciples use instruments regularly? I mean, do we read about that in the Gospels? Is that what they did? Do we read texts that show us that churches use that? Do we find passages that regulate that or give us instructions about how instrumental music is to be used? We find instructions about the, the collection, if you will. We find about the day of meeting and so forth and so on, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia. And so the question is, what do we read? Well, what we read is, we read these texts that talk about what information we have talks about Christian singing in the assembly. And not a word, a whisper, even a hint of any kind of, of musical instrument. I want to pick two out of this list because I want to move on to some other things. Look at Matthew chapter 26 for a moment and repeat it or parallel text in Mark 14. When they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Does it ever strike you as odd that that little snippet of information is, is tucked in there? in the gospel in the, the last hours of Jesus' life. Okay, yeah, they sung a hymn, then they went out to the Mount of Olives. What, what, does, what does that mean? And a related question, I guess, is wouldn't you like to know what that hymn was? My uh, sarcastic teenage side thinks it was probably 728B. <laughs> but we'll never know, at least not this side of heaven. But think about, seriously, think about what's going on here. Our Lord is modeling not only the supper, the teaching that went on during that time, the word of the Lord imparted to his disciples. They pray, they give thanks, and they sing a hymn. Jesus is modeling the kind of music that would be used to accompany the celebration of his sacrifice for our sins 
when in the future his disciples would assemble to commune with him and with other Christians in the blood of the covenant, the text tells us, in the kingdom. I want to suggest to you that what Jesus is doing this is not just some flippant throwaway line. Jesus is modeling for us the kind of worship, the sorts of things that are to be done in terms of kingdom worship. And then come over quickly, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14. There's a recent argument that has surfaced, uh, recent in the last 50 years. We're, we're talking church history here. So 50 years compared to uh, millennia that says that um, you really can't read anything in the New Testament about what churches did. There's no information there about what Christians did gathered collectively, and therefore we are at liberty to do just about whatever we want. Since we have no legislation, we have no information about it, uh, which, which is actually a giveaway to the very thing I've been saying. I mean, I, I can buy that part of the argument. And the argument then is, well, since we don't have any information about the collective activity of the church, and this is an exception to that, uh, we can do whatever we want. It's a, it's a sort of a, if you want to read the Hires blakely debate, that argument surfaced there, 1988. And it's a parallel kind of argument to one that's been made even longer than that about the work of the church. We don't have any information about how the church is to do its work in terms of benevolence or evangelism or whatever. Therefore, we can kind of do whatever we want to and erect whatever human agency or parachurch organization. The argument is very similar, if not identical. But here's a text that tells us, I will sing with the Spirit, I will pray with the understanding, also and so forth. And you come down to verse 19, where is that done? Just two, three, four verses later. In the ecclesia, in the assembly, in the church. Now this argument, by the way, throws overboard nearly every other argument that's ever been made with regard to instrumental music. It throws overboard solo. If, if there's no information about it and we're at liberty to do whatever we want, then you can't demand that everybody use an instrument or sing with an instrument. You can't use David as authority if you're going to make this argument. This more modern, recent argument pretty much throws overboard nearly every argument that's ever been made with regard to the use of instrumental music in worship uh, prior to that. And the major point to draw from from this is that these Christians were doing exactly what the Israelites did in the Old Testament. They were doing what God said. They were not, they, they didn't do this because they wanted to differentiate themselves from Judaism. They probably wanted to do that, no argument there, or from paganism to say, yeah, pagans use this in their worship. The Israelites did it, Old Testament worship, Jews do that, but we're different from pagans or Jews. But that's not why they did it. God said, sing, and they sang. They did not simply concoct their own version of worship to do whatever they wanted or whatever they thought would differentiate them from this religion or that pagan reality. They did exactly what Almighty God told them to do. And so I pose a number of questions. How is it that we account for this, after all the Old Testament text, this complete absence of anything in the New Testament with regard to that? Why is there no example of Jesus worshiping with an instrument, instructing others to do so, teaching his disciples they should do that, telling them through the Holy Spirit's instruction that here is how churches ought to worship with instruments and so forth? Absolute silence about any of that that you would expect to find in the New Testament and that some people assume that you can find just start flipping pages and surely you read something about an instrument in there somewhere because it's so popular today why are there no instances of churches doing that instructions of why this thunderous silence this wall of silence and it's a silence that's not only true of the first century it's true for the next thousand years uh, I cite the work of James McKinnon for example um, Everett Ferguson as well. McKinnon did a dissertation at Columbia University 50 years ago. This is not new information in which he examined every, nearly every reference you can find in the church fathers to the instrument. There is not a clear, uncontrover incontrovertible reference to the use of a mechanical instrument of music in the public works of the church for nearly a millennium. And even beyond that, I asked Brother Dilbeck yesterday if, if he knew if that's, I'm going to cite him as an authority, and he said, as far as, far as I know, that's still the case. And it's an impressive piece of research that has actually spawned a lot of other things. And some people have tried to nibble around the edges and, and deny it. But the truth is, the antagonism which the fathers of the early church displayed toward instruments has two outstanding characteristics, vehemence and uniformity. They were adamant in their opposition to it, 
and their opposition was uniform. The conclusion that the early church did not employ instrumental music in worship does not rest on inferences from silence, although we can draw those inferences. There are explicit statements from early Christian writers to the effect that Christians did not use instrumental music. This is Everett Ferguson again. And McKinnon is just derisive of some of these attempts to find this. He says musicologists particularly uh, have tried to produce evidence that instruments were employed in the liturgy at various times and places. The result of such attempts has been a history of misinterpretations and mistranslations. You simply cannot find it according to those who have studied the question with regard to that. And uh, while I've seen some attempts to sort of nibble around the edges and find uh, something here and there in in a 5th century Egyptian sect that may or may not have used instruments and may or may not have been in the public worship of the church, if this is wrong, somebody ought to write a refutation of it. This information has been available for half a century. It's not like it, it can't be falsified. And yet nobody seems at least yet to have been able to do that very thing. Uh, Paul Westermeyer in a standard history of church music uh, makes the case again that we don't really know precisely when instruments began to be used in Christian worship is unclear. The organ was the first instrument to appear. It was introduced about 1,000 to 1,300, somewhere along in there, and only gradually became universal. But I want to shift gears in the next maybe 10 minutes and... uh, talk about this second question that I was asked to talk about, which is, why don't people see it? I think there are a number of texts in the New Testament that actually answer this question, not just about this, but about baptism or the uh, the deity of Christ or the existence of God. Why don't more people see that? And in in a sense, I'm using this question of instrumental music as a sort of a window to look through at larger questions of authority and evidence. Look at a couple of texts in Matthew chapter 12, and you know these texts so quickly we'll go through. This is a text that David McClister was referencing yesterday, uh, where the the, 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 the uh, religious leaders are conspiring against him as to how they may destroy him. They wanted him dead, and so they're going to. Now he's done a miracle. That's pretty much indisputable. You come down a little bit later, and he performs another miracle. They say, well, he does that by Beelzebul, the, the, the prince of the demons, if the, anything ever was a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Uh, as in the text, that certainly is it. Uh, and Jesus launches into this oration about, uh, you know, who do you believe? On lesser evidence, Solomon believed, and greater than Solomon is here. On lesser evidence, the queen of the south believed, and a, a, greater, than, a greater than Jonah is here, is in the, in the first example. And uh, the men of Nineveh will arise and stand up in judgment with this group and condemn it. So my question is, why don't people see it? Well, how, how clear does evidence have to be? Uh, Jesus performs miracles in their presence. These miracles are easily verified. These were not shills that were run in in some big tent revival for some fake healer. Uh, The issue is not really the quantity or the quality of the miracles. Rather, it is in the resistance to the teaching. If somebody does not want to see it, I like what I heard Ed Harrell say many, many years ago about why people don't see things. And Ed's comment was, they just don't see it. (laughs) And that's pretty much right. If somebody's not willing to look at the evidence and already has blinders on, then there's nothing really that's going to convince them. And that's really all over a lot of New Testament texts, not necessarily about instrumental music, but about this whole question of what does it take to see something in Luke chapter 16. I beg you, Father, that you send to my father's house. And the answer is, well, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he says, no, no, no. If somebody would come back from the dead, they'd believe that. And the answer is no. If they will not be persuaded by Moses and the prophets, they would not be persuaded even if one should rise from the dead? Is there not sufficient evidence in the text of Scripture to convince us of these various ideas? Why is it that people don't see that? In John chapter 10, Jesus gives us his answer. My sheep hear my voice. The reason you don't hear me and don't listen and don't follow me is because you are not of my sheep. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Don't tell us any of these stories, these parables that are hard to understand because we do not have ears to hear. Jesus says, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. You are not listening. My sheep hear my voice. And they follow me. 
And he goes on to say, if as long as we are following and listening and believing and obeying, then we are secure. The question is not security of the believer, and that's not the topic of this lesson. The question is, will you continue to be a believer? Will you continue to listen and hear and follow and heed? That's the lesson for us. When we quit doing that, no amount of evidence is going to convince us. And uh, John 10, the Jews saw this and they pick up stones to stone him. And you can see that in a lot of other texts. I think I put Romans 1 in here. Uh, You know the text. I'm going to flip through it just to get to a summary screen here. Is it clear even about the existence of God or the deity, whatever issue you want to talk about? God made it evident to them, this text says, in so many words. His truth is clearly seen. They are without excuse who ignore the evidence from the grass under your feet to the stars overhead and the specific revelation of God in Scripture. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I guess the question is, is God obligated to provide such clear evidence on any subject, baptism, instrumental music, the deity of Christ, whatever, that only a a complete fool or an idiot, pardon my language, would, would not see it? Is he obligated, uh, I mean, he gives us proof that's overwhelming in terms of the miracles and so forth. Um, Well, why can't they see? I put all the sociology of religion stuff in there. There are at least uh, six things that I'm going to work through because I'm just about out of time. And, I mean, you can look at all the postmodernism and the entertainment as worship. Uh, Go read David Gordon's book, Why Johnny Can't Sing Hymns. And, you know, people don't believe the Bible anymore. There are all kinds of reasons for that. It's in the book. But I want to address maybe one or two last sorts of things. Um, Our culture, including, frankly, brethren, in some ways, the culture of of churches of Christ, uh, all the way out to our progressive brothers who are taking Church of Christ signs down all over the landscape, to congregations to be more familiar among us, there's a sense of uh, an allergy to conflict. We're we're pretty conflict-avoidant. Now, except for sports and politics. Sports and politics, we will argue about till the cows come home. If you don't believe me, sign on to Facebook for an hour or so. Um, But we don't like controversy in the church. We're pretty allergic to it. Can't we all just get along? And I'm not saying that we ought to just unnecessarily argue with each other for the sake and the fun of arguing. But part of what ails our culture, and maybe even the culture of the church, is this. We're not willing to disagree in a way that would cause us to study the scripture. Maybe that's a part of the issue. And I'll throw this caveat out that I mentioned earlier. Just because the majority of people, just because it's the tradition that we use instruments or we don't use instruments, in this case, the tradition for a millennium and then for centuries even after that, uh, that they, they didn't use instruments, that doesn't mean that everybody in those churches understood why they weren't using instrumental music. My guess is that there were a lot of people in those churches that that was simply the tradition that they had grown up with for the last decade, for the last generation, for the last century, for the last millennium. And so since that's the way we've always done it, is to sing without instruments, that's just the way our tradition is. And if we are not careful to teach not just the, the position on this issue or any other issue, but to teach why it's wrong, why it was right in the Old Testament because God authorized it, why it would be right in the New Testament if God authorized it, why it's not right because God didn't consult me. If we, if we want to understand that we can't go around making these arguments about, well, I, I think it's just as good to do it this way, or I, would God really care? You know, the question all the way back to the guardian, you think God really cares? What kind of, of food you eat? What kind of tree you eat from? Or I know better. It's a modern age. Surely that may have worked back in the dark ages or back in the first century, but we live in modern times. Or I've decided it's not important. It's not important to me, therefore it shouldn't be important to nearly anybody else as far as that's concerned. So if we're talking about our tradition, I'll just say what I say in the book. One needn't look no further than many present-day churches of Christ to find examples of such ignorance about why we do or do not do things in worship. Uh, as well as too often apathy 
it's just not worthy of discussion in some instances. Tradition has its own powerful inertia. And for many today, tradition seems to be the only motivation for many lax and lackadaisical religious practices. I want to close with one last footnote. Uh, somebody asked me, just as I was finishing this manuscript, I was talking with a person who said, I, I, can't really, I can't really say that somebody would go to hell for using it. Is it really that important that somebody would lose their soul over the instrument? Um, and I think I've slipped past the original slide. I, you know, God didn't ask me to determine the eternal destiny of anybody else. Not, not even people that I may be in a congregation with, may, may be working with. But I'll tell you what we are called to do is to get rid of this attitude of presumption. To, to say or to argue that um, it doesn't matter or to encourage somebody to engage in an activity when God has told us otherwise and to give them an impression that it's all right if you go ahead and do that because you like to do that or because everybody else is doing it or that's the majority position, the majority view, skates on very thin ice, walks close to the edge of the cliff. And it is a dangerous thing for us to encourage people in that kind of an attitude. I appreciate very much your attention. I want to give the next speaker all the time he deserves, so it's 10 till. I'm going to call a halt to this. Get a copy of the book. Go buy the 2005 book. If it's still available, read Melvin Curry's lecture. Thank you for coming.